Thank you, and it's really great to be here this year. I, uh, I've been tremendously blessed by what I've heard at this renewal. This is only my third one. I was telling Brother Gibbon at lunchtime, I'm not an expert on the renewals because this is only my third one that I've been to. But uh, it seems like I, uh, it seems like the preaching this year is just absolutely outstanding, more than I've ever heard it before. But I also recognize, as I said to Brother Gibbon, maybe that's just me. You know, maybe I'm just at a place in life where, you know, I'm maybe hungry or maybe thirstier uh, for a living waters renewal. And God has certainly blessed uh, myself and Sister Karen this year uh, being here. So we're so thrilled to be a part of this. And that really, though, the messages that we have heard, I, to us, they have just, they've been outstanding. Um, I thank my brothers uh, who have brought the word of God during this week. I want to close today uh, with a hymn. When I get done, number 196 is what it will be, verses 1 and 4. But just if you want to hold that in readiness, uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. My text uh, this afternoon is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8. I'm going to read 6, 7, and 8. And uh, I, I took a little bit of liberty with the, uh, the title, Brother Michael, and uh, I took it out of the text. It is the Lord of glory, but I added one word from the text, the Lord of glory crucified. So if you will take your Bible and... Uh, Turn to that, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Uh, let us stand for the reading of God's holy word. However we, starting in verse 6, However we speak among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. Please be seated. I'm also going to read a few verses from Psalm 24. This uh, passage of scripture that I'm going to read from Psalm 24 is often read in churches who follow what is called a church year, and they get to that part of the year where the ascension of Christ is highlighted, and perhaps they may even call that Ascension Sunday. Um, your church may not do that. Our church doesn't formally do that. But sometimes I'm aware that this is a good Sunday to preach on the ascension of Christ. And so I will pick a passage like this from Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift up... You everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. But our text this afternoon, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8, says that blinded sinners crucified the Lord of glory. And so no wonder that Matthew reports to us in chapter 27 and verse 45 that from the sixth hour until the ninth, there was darkness over all of the land as Jesus was dying on the cross. The Lord of glory was being crucified. Now we who are Christians today believe with all of our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and on every opportunity we uh, seek to confess that great truth. Our eyes have been opened to see the truth as it is in Jesus, recorded in the Holy Scriptures. 
And so Paul reminded the, the believers in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And uh, so as not to have them forget that truth, I think he must have uh, intended to repeat it again in the second letter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, he writes, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now our text says that blinded sinners crucified the Lord of Glory. And Lord of Glory is a title referring to the deity or the Godhood of Jesus. The fact that he was crucified refers to his atoning death on the cross on our behalf. As the Word of God says, we are justified by his blood. Now, I see two truths in this text, 1 Corinthians 2, 8, that I want to share with you this afternoon, and I've summed them up. I try to alliterate sometimes, and sometimes it perhaps is not too good. But uh, two simple points, his deity and his deed. His deity and his deed. The deity of our Lord Jesus Christ is spoken of in that title to which Paul refers to him here, the Lord of Glory. The deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, could, could there be anyone here who doubts it? The deity of Jesus is a truth woven throughout all of the fabric of Holy Scripture. Amen. And you really have to be blind not to see it. Amen. But that's, that's part of the point. A good many people are blind and do not see it. Amen. And uh, they could come to your house with a Bible in their hand, trying to win you to their cult. And uh, they go to their whatever, kingdom hall or temple or whatever they call it, and they think they're studying the Bible, and they are uh, committing a certain amount of the text to their memory, and yet somehow they're blind to this bedrock truth of Holy Scripture that Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. They don't see it. They're blind. There is only one Lord. And in the Old Testament... Uh, the that title is applied, that title Lord is applied to Jehovah or Yahweh. But in the New Testament, all of this is applied to Jesus. And brethren, this is a bedrock foundation of our faith. We refer to it as an event in history called the Incarnation. God enfleshed as man. God came into this world as a little human baby. God lying on a bed of straw in a feed trough. He could be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. He would be named Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. And he would be none other than the Lord of glory himself. Turn with me to uh, the Gospel of John, and this is a passage of Scripture that uh, I know that I mean, practically all of you are familiar with this. It's uh, the pro often called the prologue of the Gospel of John, the introduction to it. Uh, the Gospel of John was written specifically to convince us that uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and by believing that, we might have life in his name. But uh, even as I read these verses, I'm aware, uh, as I, you know, I, this is kind of like carrying coals to Newcastle. Uh, you all are aware of these scriptures, but I want to share some of them with you this afternoon in order just to solidify in our minds once more this whole, this whole idea that Jesus is the Lord of glory, and he came into this world, and he, got, he was crucified here. Well, in, in verse 1 of John 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
And then we can drop down, of course, to verse 14 and read of the incarnation of the Word of God, the enfleshment of the Word of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. The Word who was God was enfleshed and dwelt among us, this is none other than Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord of glory. Amen. Paul writes it out plain in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 when he writes to, to Timothy, God was manifested in the flesh. When the angels announced his birth, one of the brothers referred to this passage this morning. When the angels announced his birth in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11. Here's what they said to the shepherds out in the field. Actually, it was one angel. An angel of the Lord said to the shepherds, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For to you this day is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Amen. He's born to you this day. And he is right now. That baby born in Bethlehem is Christ the Lord. Amen. And that title for the baby Jesus occurs in a context where the word Lord is used to denote, uh, to denote God himself, no less than 27 times in that context. And yet the angel announced to the shepherds, Christ the Lord is over here in Bethlehem in a manger. As Donald Guthrie wrote, surely it connotes divine lordship. Now, when did it fully dawn on Jesus who he really was? You know, that's a interesting question we can speculate on. Um, I don't know for sure. You know, as, as he developed, he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Uh, he, he went through uh, the, the typical Jewish uh, educational process, uh, trained in the synagogue, learned a trade in Joseph's carpenter shop. Uh, but when, in his development, did it dawn on him that he wasn't just another Jewish boy going to the synagogue and learning a trade. I don't know. But I do know this, that by the time he began his public ministry, he knew without a cloud of doubt who he was, and that he was the only begotten son of the living God. He knew that he, him, he, knew that he himself was and is the Lord of glory. Think about this. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8, our Lord taught that he himself, here's what he said. He taught that he himself is the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah. Well, stop and think about that. That has to be a claim to deity. Amen. The Sabbath was the most sacred institution of the old covenant people. God himself instituted the Sabbath. He regulated the Sabbath. It's the longest of all of the Ten Commandments. It takes up three or four verses in, in Exodus 20. And it was not to be uh, messed around with. And when they did mess around with it, they got in pretty deep trouble. But here's Jesus in Matthew 12, 8, referring to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. No wonder the scribes and Pharisees got upset with him because they realized he was claiming to be God, deity, the Lord of glory. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38, he referred to himself as the Lord of the harvest. In both Matthew 7 and Matthew 25... He is the Lord of the judgment day, who apportions out to men their eternal destinies. Now, who could do that but God only? Amen. In his teaching, he described himself as someone greater than Jonah, someone greater than Solomon, some, my Lord. 
Paul refers to Jesus as Lord over 230 times in his epistles. What's the significance of that? Well, think of this. The word Lord was the name given to Yahweh or Jehovah in the synagogue and in the common speech of the Greek-speaking Jews, and it occurs as such over 6,000 times in their Greek version of the Old Testament. We call it the Septuagint. Over 6,000 times the word Lord uh, is, is uh, given to Yahweh or Jehovah. Paul uses it to describe Jesus. New Testament scholar J.G. Machen made this statement when in his, uh, his brilliant book on the origin of Paul's religion. He said, when the Christian missionaries used the word, he means by missionaries the, the ones we read about in the book of Acts, 